Uh, we're really uh, thrilled to uh, have uh, Matthew Clam with us this evening. So, so may maybe, maybe it's just sort of a little bit of, of an exaggeration to say the, the whole world has been waiting a long time for Matt to produce his new novel, but it's certainly true uh, that, that many who loved his acclaimed short story collection, Sam the Cat, um, which was uh, published, of course, 17 years ago, uh, have been eager for his next work, and you can just see how eager everybody's been by the size of this, this crowd this evening. A number of recent news articles and reviews of who's, uh, Who is Rich have addressed the time gap between uh, Sam the Cat and, uh, and, and the new uh, novel and what Matt has been doing and not doing in the interim, and I suspect uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that himself uh, in a minute. But I'll just add my v voice to the mounting number of others who have read Who is Rich and say it's uh, really a great read uh, that affirms all the plaudits and awards Matt received for his earlier writing, um, which uh, recognized him as an exceptionally talented, um, talented storyteller. Very briefly, for those who haven't read it yet, the new novel takes place over a few days at an artist's conference in New England. The narrator is a graphic novelist in his early 40s named Rich Fisher, who enjoyed great success early in his career and now finds himself a white middle-aged guy whose art, marriage, and life seem stuck. Uh, away from his wife and kids at, at the retreat, Rich has an affair with a woman who's uh, a painting student and, and very wealthy. Uh, but the story is much more uh, than a tale of midlife drift and angst. Uh, it's a meditation on, on many things, on family, art, money, kids, sex, um, you, you name it. And it's, and it's very funny, smart, frank, and, and altogether engaging. Plus, it contains wonderfully witty drawings by uh, John, uh, uh, John Cuneo. Uh, Ron Charles in the Washington Post called Who is Rich, quote, an irresistible comic novel that pumps blood back into the anemic tales of middle-aged white guys. Uh, he, added, he, he added that Matt is, quote, sexier than Richard Russo and more fun than John Updike. <laughs> Other reviewers have had similar uh, praise for the book. Now, as an added attraction this evening, uh, Matt will be in conversation with Jake Tapper. Some of you may recognize Jake as well, an avid customer of politics and prose. Also, also a neighbor, uh, uh, but he's also, of course, highly regarded as one of CNN's leading fake correspondents and anchors, uh, who, who in recent months has scored his share of fake scoops and provided much welcomed fake analysis. Uh, Jake is as well an uh, accomplished uh, cartoonist, um, but, but it's just uh, coincidental that he's here talking about a novel that also has a, a cartoonist as a protagonist. Uh, because he, he and Matt are, are longtime friends, uh, but I've been assured that Jake isn't just going to uh, toss softballs at, at Matt this evening. So um, Matt's going to get up here and read first, and then uh, Jake's going to join him, and then we'll take questions a after that. So please join me in welcoming Matt Clam. I'm going to say some of the uh, same things you just heard. Um, sorry. I'm going to set this up, this scene, and then I'm going to read a short scene, and then we're going to talk. Uh, every year, Rich Fisher leaves his family behind to teach a class on cartooning at an annual week-long summer arts conference. He's a graphic novelist, maybe a one-hit wonder, who now makes a living as an illustrator for magazines. Amy O'Donnell is a student in narrative painting, the mother of three, married to a brutish Wall Street titan who runs a multi-billion dollar fund. Rich and Amy met at the conference a year ago, shared a moment of passion, bonding over the shock at how their lives had turned out, then spent the winter exchanging hot texts and emails. Now they're back. Because of its location, a New England fishing village with pornographic sunsets and the Sea Breeze Motel, the conference has an easy time attracting poets, skitterish teenagers in search of illicit pleasures, 
old guys, driftwood sculptors, printmakers, actors, and playwrights. On the faculty are Nobel Prize winning storytellers, talented performers, biographers, addicts, drunkards, and perverts, one hit has beens, midless somebodies, and legitimate stars. There is a kind of heated, inordinate bonding that happens among grown ups. Forced out of their decorous privacy into visceral closeness that has the feeling of an open air loony bin. This scene takes place about 60 pages in. The reader has met Rich's wife, Robin, and two small children, and some of Rich's colleagues. In a scene before this one, Rich and Robin speak on the phone. It goes poorly. The baby hadn't slept, blah, blah. Then Rich runs into Amy in the scene just before this and has a brief conversation, burdened by the implication of their hookup a year earlier, acknowledging with some resignation that it needed to end, that they should leave the other in peace. So it's Saturday, the first official day of the conference, just after lunch at the annual softball game. I went into the dugout and looked through the mitts for one with no cracks in the leather. Tom McLaughlin sat on the bench reading his phone. Frank Gaspari walked by with his socks pulled up. He said, are we ready for this or what? On second thought, I felt scummy and rejected and ashamed. Worse looking every day, I had a cartoonist's body. Shoulders hiked up, head hung forward, face drooping, fuzzy gray hairs coming in on the sides, yellow toenails, my pot belly blousing my t shirt, forcing me to suck in my gut to fight the constant hunger of a tired, middle aged man. To be ugly in such a beautiful place was worse among the shifting sands and rotting kelp and hopeless erosion. The baseball field was at the far end of campus, inland, breezeless, and hot. You could smell fertilizer baking in the dirt. I watched an airplane fly along the bay, towing a Geico banner. Carl, the director, came across the field, lugging a duffel bag full of bats. He dropped it and jogged around the infield, ass bouncing, chains jingling in his pockets, throwing bases on the ground. Then he sat, sweating heavily, on the other side of Tom, and told us how much the bag of bats weighed and where he'd lugged it from, and how an intern named Megan Donahue had locked the keys in the shuttle bus and the cops were on the way and how the stage in the theater building had been shellacked two weeks ago, but according to the theater people, was still tacky, so the actors had to act in their socks so they didn't stick to the floor, and the playwrights were all assholes. You had to call them theater artists or the drama department, or they got angry. Then he pushed his long gray hair out of his face and went through the faculty, listing who was a piece of shit, anybody demanding a room change or failing to address students' needs qualified. And this year, for some reason, new teachers seem to be showing up with dietary restrictions or three names like Alicia Hernandez Roulette. And the poets pronounced it poetry. And if it wasn't for nice guys like Tom and me, he said, he'd quit. There was a certain headache you got after a day or so, the conference headache, which Carl already had. After three days, you got a certain taste in your mouth, conference tongue. He told us how the administrators at the state U had lied and screwed him on funding. They were nickel and diming him to death. He had booze in his car that he'd stolen from marine bio and sustainability. Then we were quiet there on the dugout bench. And Carl asked Tom how much they paid him at other summer conferences. Tom laughed and said he never left the house for less than five grand but made an exception for this, since we had parties in the windmill. More people straggled across the field. They seemed fine with the heat, pulling bats out of the duffel bag, dumping the bag to find helmets, testing swings, throwing and catching. Stan, a poet, claimed the mound to calibrate his underhand lob. An old lady with knee braces waited at the plate for batting practice. A security guard stood along the fence, and two women in beach clothes and visors sat in the stands, an able-bodied kid passed in front of the dugout, shirtless, barefoot, wearing jeans that had been shredded below the knee like a castaways, a fundamentally beautiful young person, covered in downy golden peach fuzz, handing out bottles of water. A couple of conference goers in bikinis sat on towels on the third base line in front of the other dugout, and the able-bodied kid went over and gave them water, then spilled water on them, and they screamed. He ran, but they chased him and pulled him to the ground and pinned him to down and poured water on him. Everybody was having fun. They were perfect and beautiful, whereas I was already a little revolting, although better straight on, but worse from the side. <laughs> I was 42 years old, obstructed by the limits of love, grasping at lust, scared to work on a crumbling marriage I'd be sure to hang on to for whatever remaining time we had here on earth. A young woman dug through the mitts beside me and kept flapping them open and closed until I told her that a righty wears the thing on her left hand. I got a ball and went out onto the grass and showed her how to throw and catch. 
Her name was Eva Rotmensch. Some people pronounced it Ava, she said, but they were wrong. <laughs> she walked with her turned out, she walked with turned out feet and had a flat pale face with a sharp jawbone and bluntly cut hair. She wore a cropped white blouse and pink shorts so fitted and tiny, it would be difficult to imagine any underpants surviving inside them. When she raised her arms, her shirt went with them and I saw her thin torso. She needed me to know that she belonged to the theater company as opposed to the theater workshop. Never played softball before, no sports, spent the first 20 years of her life in a dance studio. She pranced around on long, strong legs like she was still on stage, mimicking my exaggerated throwing motion, elbow back above her ear and threw it over my head and threw it into the bushes, then under the stands, waiting each time for me to go get it, like my daughter, who didn't know how to do anything and needed me to show her as though she were doing me a favor, turning whatever should have been fun into a pain in the ass. <laughs> I asked polite questions about her acting career and mentioned a few out of the way spots where people go to sunbathe, smiling at her, wondering whether she liked the beach, whether she liked swimming in big waves, feeling invisible and ignored, wondering what it would be like if, for some reason, she put down the mitt and lay on the grass and pulled down her shorts and begged me to fuck her. Art historian Marilyn Michnik sat behind the fence, smiling and serene and nearly blind, needing a cane, beside Alicia Hernandez Roulette, whose ugly little wall-eyed dog yapped around the field. Mohammed Khan, a theater critic, cleaned his eyeglasses with long, delicate-looking fingers, complaining about having to play. I don't like to get sweaty. I don't like to be wet. Vicky Capadano came toward us from right field in the baggy black t-shirt and shorts and combat boots she wore every year for softball. And a few steps behind her, Tabitha wore a baseball hat and a long thing you toss over a bathing suit that looked like a tablecloth. I recognized a couple of stragglers, among them a taller lady moving stiffly, hunched and broad-shouldered in her gray sleeveless t-shirt and blue and green plaid shorts, who I'd spoken to a few minutes earlier, Amy O'Donnell, who I'd once held as we caressed in the dark, naked and trembling, and later while sleeping in the quiet dawn. I wanted another moment with her, something I could look back on later, to get me through another year, a scene, a place to park my soul through winter months of diapers and screaming. I looked across the road, beyond the trees, to houses and a cornfield in the distance. Whatever hadn't been watered was dead. A guy in a jungle hat took batting practice, drilling balls into left field, where eight or nine people stood chatting in two clumps, some of them not even facing the batter, and I wondered if one of them would be hit by a ball and killed. <laughs> Amy went behind the dugout and started stretching, some kind of hurried knee-bend squat. She was so tall. Her people could be traced back to the northern coast of Ireland, where shipwrecked vi Vikings raped the villagers, which made them tall and fair. She <laughs> bent, she hunched, she made horrible faces. Now she squatted side to side. The guy with the water came through the trees from the parking lot and one of the girls in a bikini tried to make a run for it, shrieking, and he tackled her and spilled water on her and she screamed. They were young, although not so young, but like a different species. What's his problem, I asked Eva. Why isn't he playing? She watched him, lips parted, not smiling. She said his name was Ryan. Is he in the theater company? He's in something in New York, so he's going back and forth, taking the train, so he can't be in anything here. He rolled around on the grass. He had fine golden skin and a Chinese tattoo on his neck. As she watched him, her poor little blouse straining at every button, her ass floating in the air like a helium balloon. I threw the ball, but she wasn't looking, and it flew past her and pegged Stan in the back. He wheeled around, scowling, and kicked it away. One of these nights, maybe after a rehearsal, under glittering starlight, Ryan might meet Ava walking from the theater to the dorms. And may it not turn into a long-term monogamous relationship, and may it end in a mutual hate fuck. Amen. <laughs> Behind us, a group of interns stood blocking the dugout, looking sweaty, stealing our water, complaining to Muhammad Khan about having to clean up the tent after lunch. The kitchen is a total slime pit. We're totally covered in slime. They went on complaining as they tipped up bottles of water. 
a young woman in a torn miniskirt with torn black stockings and heavy mascara, and her sleepy-looking friend filling out a t-shirt with the school's name across her chest, and a third one with bouncy, eggy, shiny hair. It was as if the water they poured down their throats went right into their sumptuous breasts to keep them full. Four more days of this, then I could go home and choke my wife. There were enough of us now to split into two teams. People wandered out to take positions so we could start. I pictured myself heaving over some sullen 19-year-old, my baggy old face hanging down, and went along the dugout thinking filthy thoughts, grabbing helmets and lining them up beneath the bench, and asked nicely if anyone had the order and saw that I was batting seventh. On this broiling Saturday afternoon, where were the cuties of my youth? Women in their 40s had replaced them, hunching toward the grave. For so long I'd been young, but that was over, and the thing to do now was teach a little comics and go home, where I could drop my eyeglasses in the toilet and fall down the stairs in my pajamas, somebody wailing in the background while I stood in my kitchen in a state of shock, loading the dishwasher. <laughs> Vicky came over and put her mitt on her head and said, let's get on with it already. I needed to find someone at this conference, someone who wouldn't harm a married man, or hated being married, or couldn't bear to be alone for three or four days. I didn't have any big strategy here. I liked to flirt. I needed to stay alert every second for a potential alliance in this war against morbidity and death. Were there rules or prohibitions? Some of my colleagues preyed upon the young, their own students, the low-hanging fruit, which struck me as a real character flaw. I wanted a grown-up, maybe with children of her own, someone who was needed somewhere else and wouldn't get hooked. I'd driven the many miles here with purpose and concentration. I had to make the most of my time away from home. Over the last ten years, the stuff I'd done could be counted on one hand. A couple of late-night goodbyes that never got past the talking stage. A wriggling blonde woman at a convention in Brooklyn who edited textbooks for a living. Ruth. Gogelberg. Gunkelman, whatever, at this very conference three or four years ago. It started when I was 16. It started when I was five. The need for a girl to save me, the need to escape, in a panic to get away from my mother and father out of this empty shell. I always had a girlfriend, always fell in love, and even at my most saintly and sexless, I always liked someone out there, was working at something, moving toward it with intention and forethought, nibbling around the edges until I hated the whole thing, until everything I did became about not cheating, not doing something, until it was pretty much a foregone conclusion, and all I had to do was pull the trigger and get it over with so I could slink back to my safe and stable perch and pretend it never happened, and hate myself, and think of someone new. Amy finished stretching and pulled her hair back into a rubber band. Our thing went beyond lusty one-liners and therapeutic confessions. I'd been in love with her for a year. Not love, whatever it was. And it just so happened that her personal misery, hidden behind a windfall of prosperity, was ironically charged, luridly beguiling, and possibly useful in a practical sense as fact-based material for the once and future semi-autobiographical storyteller. She walked into the dugout. I stood and walked out, pretending not to know her. She found a bat and went behind the, the backstop and took practice cuts, swinging so hard her helmet fell off. The game started. A big, sandy-haired kid stepped into the batter's box and golfed the first pitch high and gone. It landed in the parking lot, where it bounced as people cheered, as he ran around the bases with his arms hanging down like a pigeon-toed ape. Muhammad Khan could barely lift the bat and tapped a base hit. Tabitha got up and somehow outran a dribbler down the first baseline. Then Amy went to the plate, grimacing into the sun, and took a wild cut. She hit it pretty well. The second baseman knocked it down but couldn't hold on. He picked it up and tagged Tabitha softly on the shoulder, then threw the ball over the first baseman's head, over the dugout, where it beamed the golf cart that had driven Marilyn Michnik here. Muhammad limped home. When the ball is thrown out of play, the runner is awarded the next base. Amy waited at first. I couldn't stop myself and yelled, take second. She looked at me as though the last thing in the world she needed was a man yelling at her in public. She got enough of that at home. It was a confusing moment. I still had some investment or pride in her. I wanted her to thrive, succeed, whatever. So I stood in front of the dugout, waving her on. She ran down the base path, unsure, 
reached second, and stared right at me as she stomped testily on the base with both feet, stomped as though to defy me, but no one had bothered to anchor the base, so it skipped out from under her, and she fell, and didn't get up. The pitcher, Stan, walked to second base. The shortstop knelt. Nobody seemed to be moving. As I got closer, I saw that her whole mood had shifted. She'd come to a sitting position, her arm in her lap. She seemed drunk, the way a drunk is soft, sleepy, in shadows, fighting to stay awake. She was staring down into her lap as if a haze floated in front of her. Looking at her arm, I had to force myself to breathe. It was my fault. I'd done it. I pushed that thought away. "'What's up?' Carl asked, standing so close he was brushing my shoulder. He hadn't seen her fall. Then he looked. I watched his face change. She was sitting with one leg folded under herself, foot turned, knees bent, so that the whiteness of her inner thighs showed. The girl kneeling beside her talked in a loud voice, holding Amy's forearm. "'Tip your head forward. That's good. Now deep breath. Just relax. You're going to be fine. Don't look. It's okay. I've got your arm.' and Amy saying, in a kind of husky, sleepy voice, I don't want to look, and then a guy in a Red Sox cap came over and draped her arm with a t-shirt. The security guard called for an ambulance. Vicky walked across the infield dirt, squinted at Amy, then turned to me. Our former and potential closeness made me think she could read my mind. My thoughts were slow and bleeding and obstructed, but I noted, finally, that Amy had been a kind of home, a vessel for my discombobulated mind, that my own family treated me like a footstool, but this stranger had cared for my soul. At some point, we could hear sirens on the highway. They decided to get Amy out of the sun, and with heavy assistance, she stood and took a few unsteady steps and began lowering herself down to the grass, her legs bending, collapsing, as her handlers bumped into each other, holding her arm, wavering, guiding her down, her legs folded in beneath her, all wrong. They raised her up again as though it had been their fault. Ready? Sure. And again she went down, and this time she tucked her chin and went completely out. Amy, the girl said, kneeling. We all waited. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Do you faint easily? She nodded. I wish you told me that before. I wouldn't have moved you. Amy's gaze drifted down to the t-shirt covering her arm as if it were some new friend. She said, I didn't know until I fainted. An EMT and three paramedics arrived, asking a series of questions, name, day of the week, name of the U.S. president, and each time Amy answered politely, can you move your fingers? I can, but I don't want to, but thank you. The slapstick fainting, the bone snapped at mid-forearm, crooked and flopping in the sleeve of her skin, not life-threatening but stomach-churning, her broken summer day, her arm lying in her lap, all of us standing over her as Carl used the security guard's walkie-talkie. They strapped her to a red steel chair on wheels. I knelt down and attempted to communicate without making known any extramural bond between us. Do you want me to come with you? She shook her head. The whole bottom half of her face was trembling. Sweat or some kind of moisture pooled in her eyes. Carl signed off and handed the radio back to the guard. The hell with it. They wheeled her out. Vicky stood beside me, sighing loudly, and when I looked at her, she gave me a deep, penetrating stare. When I couldn't come up with anything to say, she went behind the dugout and started smoking. We resumed the game. Other people fell to the ground with injuries. Stan stumbled off the mound, holding his elbow. Luther Voigt pulled a hamstring. During my turn at bat, I hit a fizzing pop-up and felt something go in my back and couldn't stand up straight. And walking back to the dugout, I used the bat as a cane and watched from the bench as a string of elderly, scarred, limping septuagenarians hit and ran to the satisfying cheers of our team. I had one decent catch in left off a whistling line drive and another off a deep fly ball. Both times I thought my legs would crumple and I'd fall to the ground, waiting for those balls to bang into my mitt, but I didn't. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. That was great. So one of the things you, you, uh, you touched on um, in your great book, is um, the graphic novelist Rich is 
semi-autobiographical, which is something that has been said about your work in general. As you know, I've, I'm constantly telling you never to include me in any of your work. <laughs> For years, Jake has been wondering whether I was going to um, reveal a character named Blake Snapper in my latest piece of fiction. Just, I'm working on it. Just uh, constantly cautioning never to include him <laughs> in any of your work. Um, but one of the things that's so interesting uh, about this book is that y in, a, in a kind of meta way, you, you play with the concept of it because Rich, at a, at a point in the book, talks about taking the experience that he's going through and turning it into uh, a semi-autobiographical work. Um, do you want to read a little section of that? Just yeah, I don't know if this is what you were talking about. Now I'm thinking. Now you're thinking no? I mean, I we did prepare. <laughs> we did prepare, but maybe he found. No, you, don't, you don't have to read it if you don't want to. but, it, but no, the, don't to. Because it was just about the notion of taking people in your life whom you care about and experiences that you go through and then changing them just a little bit and... and um, I'd been conducting these kinds of experiments for years, leaning on details of my personal life, trying to represent the truth, to give form to this confusion, wondering how close I could cut it, worrying about the people and worrying how the people involved might react. I didn't enjoy hurting their feelings. If I could have figured out another way to do it, I would have. Certain friends spooked easily and felt threatened by my borrowed or poorly disguised representations, or harbored some innate persecution complex and became chiding, distant, or hostile, although the ones I'd intentionally set out to unnerve or unmask either failed to get the hint or tolerate it well, <laughs> or felt proud to have inspired me. Such are the pitfalls of autobiographical cartooning. Um, but that seemed to me the be, to be the actually the most autobiographical thing in the book. Uh -huh. uh, that that section is that. Uh, yeah. what, what are the pitfalls of of exploiting your own life uh, for your fiction? Well, I'm not sure if this is the right answer, but. Um, you would have to be a total sociopath not to be at all concerned about real people out in the world if you're writing and in some ways your writing has anything to do with um, your life. One of the r things that I was trying to do in this book was give the reader a feeling of the immedi immediacy of me trying to write a story and it's sort of rich is trying to come up with material for a piece of, uh, of fiction for a graphic novel. And I wanted the reader to be with him in his anxieties about the fallout of his work. Um, so uh, I wanted to make him anxious and afraid. Um, and I have also been anxious and afraid when I've worked and worried about how things I wrote would affect people. And I've gone through some of that stuff there. There is only one person in the book who's mentioned who actually sort of says, I'm done with you because you wrote about me. And the other people, he's really not sure. He's not sure if one of his friends just moved to New York and he lost touch with him or the guy actually wrote him off. And he's too uncomfortable because he did use elements of the guy's biography to get in touch with the guy. So you don't know. Rich is a fairly unreliable person and you're stuck with his anxieties and his struggle to sort of process what he's doing while he's doing it. So, um, yeah. So that was a feeling that I wanted to get across in the book. It's, it's great. It's brilliant. The, um, uh, every review I've read uh, has been incredibly effusively positive. Um, of course, I only read the ones that you post on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> But they, but they are the big ones, the, the New York Times and, and else. But the, but the one theme, as has been alluded to before, is that you have a lot of fans here who read Sam the Cat uh, back when Bill Clinton was president and, um, are, are, and have read your nonfiction and um, your, your short story that was in The New Yorker, but have wondered about the follow-up book. Will you tell us what took you so long? I mean, I know the answer, but why don't you, why don't you tell them? <laughs> you have a lot of fans who wonder. Um, I was working that whole time. I really was. I mean, I wrote a book's worth of nonfiction magazine journalism, and if that had been published, we wouldn't, I guess, be talking about this. But I did sort of feel like in 2000 or 2001, I didn't have anything to say anymore. 
And I'm sure there's a few writers in the room, and you probably have that feeling, which is, you know, you've written yourself out, and you kind of need to recharge your batteries. And I think I needed that. And then, you know, things happened, like I got married, bought a house, had a kid, started living um, a much different life. And it took a while to make sense of that. And um, I also, I was at... Um, brunch with this guy. He's a famous biographer. His name is Blake Bailey. He did the Cheever biography, and he's working on the authorized biography of uh, Philip Roth. And he had contacted me because he found a mention of me in Philip Roth's letters in the Library of Congress, and he wanted to tell me. But he also wanted to rub it in my face that I was done as a writer. He wanted to meet me and say, I really loved your book. Too bad you don't write anymore. And he's really, he's a great writer, but he's really mean. So we're sitting there at brunch, and he's like, what happened to you? And it's all past tense. And I was, I'd already started this book. It was like 2011. I was like, fuck you. But I sort of, it just came out of my mouth. I said, I never wanted to write another short story. And when I heard myself say that, I was like, oh, maybe that was the problem. Like, I hadn't given myself permission to write something bigger. And I hadn't really geared up for that. And I didn't want to write another short story. Because for me, a short story sort of takes every single thing I care about and a year of work. And then it's a short story, which is great. But I just, I'd done it eight times, and I couldn't do it again. So that. It's a good answer. So <laughs> the, uh, there is a section of the book for those of you. How many people here have read Who is Rich? I know you have, Taffy. OK. So there's a very, insen a very intense and very long uh, romantic, would be the wrong word, uh, sexual uh, moment, l long extended sexual moment. <laughs> Uh, the encounter between, uh, I don't think it's a spoiler, to, between Rich and someone else. Um, could you want to read a little teeny bit of excerpt? Because it's, it's, oh, so it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, okay. it's fun and excruciating and, and hilarious and, and um, painful. <laughs> um. I'm just trying to see how dirty this is. You've already said the F word several times, so I think... Uh, any children have been removed from the premises. I'm just going to read the beginning of this scene. So this is, um, so after... Yeah, um, stick with the foreplay. No, it's a, it's a, so after um, uh, Amy breaks her arm, uh, Rich finds her in the clinic there, and he sort of sees her through the bone setting, and uh, then he accompanies her back to her dorm room where he's supposed to sort of just like make sure she's okay, and she's got um, really strong drugs uh, you know, uh, schedule, yes, schedule three, is that what it's called? <laughs> Oxycontin, and she's, um, and she's supposed to take, she, she's, her, the lidocaine is wearing off, and she's supposed to take this stuff, except he forgot to get the prescription. So she's waiting, and so he rushes back, and she's in a lot of pain, and while she's <laughs> suffering, and he's giving her one pill and then another pill, he takes one or two for himself. <laughs> So this is the scene right after that sort of takes effect. I'm just going to read a tiny bit of this, and then what follows is a lot of uh, naughty business on opioids. <laughs> Light came in waves. Sound came in waves. Cicadas out the window sounded like distant machinery. It's numb, she said, touching her splint. I had a similar thing going on with my face. I drifted in and out, alert but adrift, in love with mankind. The lower parts of us, oh, they're, they're like on the bed together by now. They don't see, he's not sure how they got that way. The lower parts of us rhythmically dry humped. I'd crawled into bed with her at some point. My heart beat time with nature's green machine. I understood the language of insects. I thought this was the most beautiful little room on earth and humped her harder and the two of us crammed in together on her twin bed. I felt a cool sensation around my mouth. It was drool. <laughs> I was drooling. She broke her thumb once playing field hockey. Something else happened skiing. I wasn't listening. It wasn't just the ache in my back. My whole helmet was gone. The whole case of mistaken identity that had chained me to the furnace in my basement for the last five years. The whole doomed provisional future. The sodden memories of rancorous domesticity. Poof. I'd drawn a new circle where the head had been. 
Out the window, an Evian banner chased an airplane across the bay. Gangnam style rang out in the courtyard. I felt sluggish, a little queasy, like a sick kid in heavy pajamas. I slipped my hand in, stroking and cupping her everywhere. Amy leaned back and opened her mouth and reached up with her good hand to feel my face. Nobody touches me except my kids, she said. No hands on me, no skin against mine. Anyway. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun and great chapter. Um, Rit, Robin, who is Rich's um, wife, long-suffering, um, is, uh, is, a, is a benign character. Uh, you don't really feel sympathy for Rich in terms of his frustrations in the marriage. Robin seems great, uh, and the kids seem wonderful. Um, Rich is clearly uh, the one with the, the biggest problems in the book. Amy, I have to say, and I've told you this several times, I didn't, she's a great character, I didn't particularly care for her. I, I mean, she's a, she's a wonderful character for a book, but she's not, um, she, she's, she's part of the problem, right? Um, when you're writing a character like Amy, even if it is counterbalanced by somebody like Rich, who is nuts, um, how, uh, do you worry at all about going too far and making her villainous? And she's not villainous, but but make, making her too negative in any way. What sensitivities as a male author do you have in writing a female character? Uh, I plenty, but um, I I think I was trying to be as aware as possible of giving a fully three dimensional um, understanding of Amy's predicament, which is deep. And it, you know, this narrator rich knows about her early life. He knows about violence. She suffered. He knows about the lack of financial, um, resources in her family growing up. He knows about exactly the kind of rub she was in as a kid who grew up with nothing in a family of seven with a dad who didn't live very long, who got a chance to work on wall street and she just took it and ran with it. And has since been a sort of heavily guilt-ridden philanthropist. I think I was trying as hard as I could to give those other aspects of her personality to show her as somebody full-blown because I can't make people that likable. I just can't do it. But I do think that the most important thing for a uh, piece of artwork is to make the person who's experiencing it feel alive. You know, I think novelists should be pretty in love with life and be pretty interested in almost everything. And I think if you're sort of attacking the problem with those two ideas, whether the person is likable or not, I think is sort of secondary. Why don't we open the floor to some questions and maybe I'll do some follow-ups here and there, or maybe I won't, depending how good your questions are. Uh, we have a microphone there, and we have a microphone there. And they're filming this, so if you want to go to the mic, it helps, because then you're on uh, the f Let's not be video. bashful, people. If you don't have to. We could just start drinking. Is there? <laughs> Someone to pass drinks around? While somebody... All right, well, well um, there we go. All right. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Um, I just wanted to say I think it has a lot of potential for, for, uh, as a script. Um, there's a lot of detail in it, so, you know, but uh, I think it's uh, a lot of potential. I was, uh, you, you, you raise a, a theme in the book that I've you know, sort of uh, come across myself, which is that no one today, e e at celebrities, you know, celebrity status, I guess, has made, you know, people who don't make it to celebrity status, um, you know, sort of feel like whatever they've accomplished isn't really amounted to much. I mean, like they feel like failures. And I was wondering if you were trying to capture uh, some of that in, you know, the way you, uh, you know, like the ordinary things of, of, of having a family and so forth, and even they, you know, they, that doesn't have an sufficient meaning. So, so the question is, what motivated you to, to, to uh, you know, the, to write this, I mean, pursue this theme? That I think you're trying yeah, to Yeah, so this is a guy who's stuck trying to reclaim his early, what's supposed to be his, like, you know, early potential. Right. He has that rub. He has the rub that any artist has, which is if I'm not making art, you know, um, what am I, who am, you know. But um, he has a problem, which I sort of have too, which is that my baseline of depression isn't l really low enough. Well, so there's plenty of times when I'm sort of happy to be alive and I really don't care about making stuff. And... Um, that is at in conflict with trying 
to have greatness and celebrity and make great art, you know? Yeah, it's a conflict. I think it's a conflict for a lot of people. I think it's doing versus being, you know? It's like, is it okay that I'm actually, like, working in my garden and loving it and no one can see this right now? Should I Instagram it and maybe <laughs> that'll help? You know, I think it's a struggle that everybody in this room is involved in right now with social media, which is, you know, s suddenly spraying, you know, y the most private elements of your life out there and kind of hoping for connection from other people. And it is, in a way, just simply that, and it's not to be looked down on. It's about wanting to connect with other people. But then there's this other thing that you're inextricably connected to, which is the ambition to have gone viral, you know? Even if it's gone viral with the 20 people who are your followers, you know? You just can't help it. So he's wrapped up in that rub, too, you know? And he's been underground, in a way, with two kids who haven't slept well since they were born, and they're four and one. And he's living that very closed-in life inside the cave. A lot of us know. I actually see some of my neighbors here who are in that cave right now. And, um, and, and it's okay, you know? It's a full life. You don't have time for anything else. But he has this other sort of burning, you know, um, ambition or whatever. It comes on him at the conference. The conference is one of these places where your whole conventional life is set aside and suddenly you've got, you know, your, your art, you know, for the students who attend it, it's that one thing, I just want to get up and read my poem on stage, you know, and for the teachers, they get to really focus in, too, um, on that, that one thing. It's hard to have a life, though, and be concerned with that artistic pursuit, you know? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Go ahead, sir. There's a microphone right there. All right. Full confession. I'm his father-in-law. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I did, uh, last night at dinner, I said to Matt, you know, uh, reading your book, there will be men in there between 40 and 50, you're so powerful a writer, they're going to be jumping off of bridges. Uh, and one of the questions I, I thought of after that is for, for a writer to be successful in conveying uh, the uh, ordinary difficulties of life, like kids waking up and throwing, over you, throwing up over you and all that sort of thing. Do you have to write it in capital letters to catch their attention? You know, is, I don't want to call it an exaggeration, but if you, is, you have to, do you have to soup it up in, or, in order to make it uh, that's a good. That's a good question, Stan. Thank you. I think that the key, and I think this is a, a great for any writer to think about, is that specificity is really you know, essential. And specificity sort of doesn't come easily. Um, I'm really into lists, too. I have, like, paragraph, you know, page-long paragraphs sometimes that just sort of list details about things. And, yeah, it's, I think there's a sort of, you want to inoculate your piece of writing against anyone putting it down and, or anyone sort of denying its veracity. And, like, hitting them with a lot of really powerful details is a way to do it. And I'm sort of merciless in that, and I want people to know that I know that I've been there you know, so, uh, yeah, I'm into that. And so, especially with this, you know, child rearing with little kids, I wanted to make sure um, people knew how much I'd suffered. <laughs> Hi, I'm Olivia. Um, the suffering of middle-aged white men is, has been sort of a punchline in the culture in the last couple of years. And I'm wondering, how do you... Take uh, that. <laughs> Can people hear that in the background? So the question, the question was, how do you sort of uh, reconcile this idea that you're writing about the suffering of middle-aged white men? I'm just saying a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, so I, I guess the, 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 there's a lot of really smarter answers than this, but I was really just focused on these three, four people. And I just wanted to tell their story, and they just so happened to be whoever they were. But I can't really think in those terms, so I kind of ignored that stuff. And I think for anybody, when you're working, you sort of have to ignore the world. And you, like an adolescent kid, you slam the door, and it's like playing your guitar, you know, so with the door closed and your parents can't get in there. I just wanted to keep the world out and focus on these three people and their problems. And, you know, um, that's all I could do. But can I, okay, so I'm going to do, do a follow-up to that. So, but as a, a voracious reader, yes. you know that Updike, Richard Ford, I mean, on and on, the entire section over there uh, is middle-aged white men and their existential crises and affairs and whatever. 
And this was alluded to in, I think, one of, one of the many glowing reviews. I forget if it was the Times or the Post or the Globe or whatever, but one of them said, you would think that this, this would be cliche and tired, but Matt has brought life into it and, and, uh, and you know, so the challenge was even higher. But you had to know that that challenge existed. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I th you know, like a lot of the things that were uh, problems in the book that I could foresee a reader having a problem with, I faced it head on and I had a character who is the sort of person who intimidates the, the narrator the most and his name is Angel Salido and he walked as a 12 year old from Guatemala to the United States to find his parents and then he wrote a graphic novel about it that has exploded in the last three months he arrives at the conference just glittering and r r the narrator just seeing this guy is shaking and I was trying to acknowledge a conflict that many of us are in where the basic frame of our lives is not larger than life there are people who have amazing stories I was talking to a guy in Boston when I was reading the other day I was in a uh, shirt store earlier and I was talking to this guy and he asked me what I was doing and then he said you know I have a story I was born in Ghana and I can smell the kerosene lamps and I had to walk I forget how far it was with this bucket on my head to get water in the morning and I said that sounds like a really good story and he said and I'm at Harvard now and he said and I'm the manager of this store and I said, here's my email, send me your memoir, and I'll look at it. It's an amazing thing. I can't compete with that. And so I had a, <laughs> a narrator who was struggling with a guy who's right up in his grill with exactly that kind of larger-than-life story. There's nothing you can do about that except be honest as you can, and it turns out you're a human being and you have a story to tell, too. You know, so. Anybody on this side of the room? I'm just trying to go back and forth. I'm trying to go back and forth. There's someone over there. We'll get appears. to you, Taffy. Yes. We'll get to you. <laughs> um, I'm here because of Sam the Cat. I'm sure other, many other people here. And I can still remember laughing out loud uh, reading that. There's very few authors that can do that. Uh, are there any authors that inspire you? Or I can think of one that comes to mind that. I associate your type of humor. Yeah, who's that? It's Mr. Sanford, my daughter's science teacher. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> From many years ago. <laughs> Carl Hyacinth. Uh-huh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Well, it's but funny th that my... Well, I just, it's funny that, we, you know, we got, we, they, they got early, like, data back from advanced readers on my book, and the readers were like, because it had, like, all this stuff on it, you know, like, how great the book is, and it's hilariously, and people were like, it's actually not hilarious. It's funny. So we took out hilarious. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, a zillion funny writers, but it is hard to find, you know, I mean, Lori Moore is so funny, especially her first, like, three collections. Um, I love her. I love Ben Lerner. I think he's so funny. Um, I find funny stuff in all kinds of writers. There's an amazing scene I teach that Alice McDermott writes from uh, That Night, one of her early novels that I think is funny and kind of beautiful. And I think anybody who's really brilliant has funny stuff in it because it's the cosmic gale of laughter, you know? Maybe it doesn't make you laugh out loud. If you want to laugh out loud, there's a book by Jack Handy called The Stench of Honolulu. And the print is really big, so you just fly through it. It's a good one. Anybody who read the profile of Matt in New York Magazine uh, just a few weeks ago, this is the author of that. Taffy, <laughs> what's your question? Um, Hi, Taffy. Hi. I wanted to say that I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, writing about white middle-aged <laughs> men. Um, <laughs> but what I really wanted to ask is, are you working on another novel yet? No. Yes, it's almost done. <laughs> do you have, are, are, like, are you, like, do you? No. <laughs> do you have any... <laughs> <laughs> to start anything or like is that is 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 it at all especially since you're asked so many times about this is um is it in your head at all about some about a time you're going to start something or are you just not even thinking about it when i close my eyes i can picture a character named blake snapper <laughs> okay. i don't know who he is yet i'm not sure what he's doing i just have the name
but I'm just throwing stuff in a file, you know. I got to look at it someday, but yeah. How are we doing? Uh, we, we can take a few more. I have a question over here. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of wealth as a mm -hmm. literary device for you, because I know yeah. 20 years ago you wrote a piece in the New York Times Magazine about yeah. all your rich friends. Yeah. And then you've got this, which yeah. has a double entendre in the name. Yeah. I'm just wondering what, what role it plays and maybe the backstory behind how that becomes part of your work. I'm still not rich. <laughs> Did everybody hear the question? I'm not sure if the, the so the question was basically about the uh, themes. Uh, it is a theme in the Matt Clam uh, oeuvre that uh, uh, the, the class and and wealth disparity more uh, wealth I think, but but uh, and but the class that wealth can buy you. Um, uh, and it's a theme in this book. It's a theme in certainly in. Uh, issues I dealt with in therapy from Sam the Cad and issues uh, an article for, uh, that you wrote for the New York Times Magazine. Yeah, I mean envy is a driving, you know, it's a strong emotion that I use. Um, I, a lot of the lower urges I like to get involved in. And envy <laughs> is definitely one of them. Um, I mean the, the 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 love interest's husband is a kind of a rapey billionaire, you know. And when I started working on this in 2010, I didn't think one would be running the country. <laughs> you know, destroying the world. But I did think they're taking up more and more room. I mean, just, pri you know, this guy's in private equity. Private equity, you know, is like they own highways now. You know, they're driving the airline industry. It's just so weird how the financialization of our country has quietly influenced so much stuff that we come into contact with every day and we kind of don't know it and we're kind of powerless. And this guy... The, the the love interest husband is sort of a type. He's not he's a caricature. You don't ever meet him, but he's kind of there. He contributes to dark money. He believes he doesn't believe in climate change, and he makes 120 million dollars a year. And there are guys like that, you know, and they fascinate me, and I'm terrified of them. And um, so anyway, it was easy for me to get to be scared of that. Rich as a character is full of strong feelings. He's full of strong feelings about his own self-loathing. He's full of strong feelings about the weather uh, at the beach. He's full of strong feelings of envy. He falls madly in love. He's madly in love with his children. He has all kinds of strong feelings. And one of the things that he has strong feelings about is feeling less than, you know, in, a, in the 1% economy. And so I tried to talk about that some. One last question, and then uh, Matt, I think, is going to sign some books. Sure. Hi, my, my name is Carlos. Uh, I'm from Texas, and my question is is about the, some of the characters in in your book uh, are are quite young. Um, some of the even though they might not be the central ones, and and I'm interested when you started out uh, as a young writer, what was some of the best advice that you've got, or what were some of the things that you've now learned that you wish you had known when you started out um, as a young writer? Well, one of the things is that this guy who he's talking to, who's also teaching a cartooning class, whose name is Angel Salito, who's younger, but is, uh, is this graphic, hot, you know, graphic novelist. They're talking about the class they're about to teach. And uh, he says, they're sort of like, you can't teach the story. The story is in you. It has to come out. And that's it, you know? I mean, we're natural storytellers. Human beings are natural storytellers. We do it every day. We do it when we sit there at breakfast and we're half asleep. You know, you actually don't need the terminology and you don't need, like, you don't need a fancy degree. I mean, that stuff, I think, once you're cooking, can give you a couple free years sometimes. You get a fellowship, but try not to go into debt for an MFA, you know? So, anyway, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's already in you and you don't, need um, a advice from me on how to get it out. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. It's been great. Thanks, everybody. Here. Thank you for writing the book. It's so fun. <laughs>